Welcome to my course. My name is Dave Siroff and I'll be your instructor. So many dangers to the security of your network, how do you defend against them all? Well, that's what this course is all about. Adequate time and resources are hardly ever given to the most crucial steps in securing a network. With this course, I'm going to give you 12 steps to follow that include the most crucial steps. So you'll be sure to cover everything. Likewise, you'll be sure not to spend a whole lot of time on steps that don't add much value. Who is this course for? Really, anybody that needs to secure a network, which would include engineer or security analyst, a manager with limited technical knowledge, likely you would be employing an engineer or security manager, the owner of a SOHO, which is small business, a small office, home office, and really anyone wanting to learn more about network security. This course is based on my over 20 years of hands-on experience in IT, much of it spent as a security analyst and network engineer. Based on my experience, the sort of knowledge and insights that you can't read in a textbook is what you'll find in this course. So let's talk specifically what we'll cover. We'll start with basic concepts where you'll be learning the basic concepts necessary to understand the lectures. Then we start with the steps. Step one, write a security policy. Step two, educate end users and IT staff. Step three, implement physical security. Step four, implement perimeter security. Step five, use good password management. Step six, eliminate unnecessary services. Step seven, Implement good patch management. Step eight, implement antivirus measures. Step nine, implement access control. Step 10, secure data in transit. Step 11, IDS and IPS. Step 12, back up your data. But that's not all. We have 10 live demos to reinforce the lecture. I will demonstrate on real equipment the concepts that you've learned in the lectures. This is the best way to reinforce your knowledge. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the course. Welcome to the video on basic concepts. Before we get to step one, we need to understand a few basic concepts of network security. This will give you the necessary background to tackle the 12 steps. The first concept is the CIA triad. This is one of the most basic principles of information security. CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In general, all data that you wish to keep secure needs to remain confidential, maintain integrity, and also be available. Confidentiality means simply keeping data secret. Well, secret from those who are not authorized to view it. Integrity means keeping data from being modified by unauthorized people or by accident. And availability means that information is available when you need it. The next concept is AAA or authentication, authorization, and accountability. Authentication means proving that you are who you say you are. So if you log in as Huckleberry and you produce Huckleberry's password, then the system will likely authenticate you. Authorization means the actions that it is possible to perform once you've been authenticated. Usually this defines what files you can read, write, or modify. And the third concept is accountability. This holds users accountable for their actions on the system. It's usually done with logging and auditing. Uh, one of the things you see a lot with accountability is if you're paying uh, for the amount of time you use on the network, it will be stored there. The next concept is defense in depth. Multiple layers of security. 
multiple layers of security are used to protect resources in the network. The idea is if one layer of security fails, that another layer will still provide protection. A simple example is a server in a locked room. Even if an intruder succeeds in breaking into the server room, the intruder does not have access to the data on the server without a password. Next concept we look at is the principle of least privilege, which means you should only be able to access necessary information. A user must only be able to access information on the network that it is necessary to do their job. Likewise, a process must only be able to access the, ne the network resources that it needs to perform the legitimate services of that process. The next concept is good faith. And if you ask about good faith, you should have it. Per Wikipedia, and I quote, in contract law, the implied covenant of good faith and fair, and fair dealing is a general presumption that the parties to a contract will deal with each other honestly, fairly, and in good faith, so as not to destroy the right of the other parties to receive the benefits of the contract. Well, what does this mean in terms of information security? What this means in terms of information security is that the information on your network belonging to others should be protected in good faith. That is, it should be protected by all reasonable means. This is really all you can do. Now, I'm not a lawyer and I can't give legal advice, but should there ever be a security breach, you will most likely be in a much better legal position if all good faith efforts have been made to protect that data. The next concept is stewardship, meaning engineers don't own the network. Dictionary.com defines stewardship, quote, the position and duties of a steward a person who acts as a surrogate of another or others, especially by managing property, financial affairs, real estate, etc. So what this means, if you are employed as a security analyst by a company, then you are the steward of the company's data, not the owner. The actual owner of the data is the company's management you are responsible for securing the company's data to the best of your ability within the framework management has been has implemented. You are responsible to advise management how to best keep data safe. But the ultimate responsibility goes to management. Management that does not heed reasonable advice of the security analyst may be guilty of not acting in good faith. The next concept is the OSI reference model. If you have not seen the OSI reference model, I recommend you go to Wikipedia or some other site and take a look at it. This is extremely important to understand, but it's really too basic to go over in this course. Everyone needs to memorize this for all kinds of tests, like, like the uh, basic Cisco test or whatever. but it is something that is much more useful than just the fact that you have to memorize it in tests. And that is that each layer, if you figure on a security, a particular security area, if you understand the layer where that falls into, it will help you to understand overall things much better. And the last concept we will look at is hackers and black hats. The word hacker can be a misunderstood term, so we will avoid it in this course. We will use the term black hat to refer to people that break into or compromise, or at least attempt to, a network not belonging to them with malicious intent. Such malicious intent may include financial gain or 
political agenda. Whatever it is, you need to defend your network against black hats. That is the end of this lecture. I hope to see you again in step one. Welcome to step one. Write a security policy. A security policy should cover the most likely threats to the network and the best ways to minimize them. A risk assessment may be used to determine how likely specific threats are. A risk assessment will often give a dollar amount that it would cost the company should a particular risk be realized, which is multiplied by the number of times that risk is likely to be realized per year. So if a particular risk is estimated to cost $2,000 each time it occurs, and it's likely to occur three times per year, then the cost for that risk is $6,000 on a, on a yearly basis. A different risk might be estimated to cost $5,000 each time it occurs, and it may be likely to occur seven times a year. Then that risk would cost $35,000 on a yearly basis. So it would make sense to give a higher priority to the second risk and to spend more money and time on it. Now, if a risk has a very small dollar amount and it's not likely to occur very often, then you might decide to simply forget about that risk altogether and not, uh, and, uh, not even bother with it. Now, you need to be aware that a risk assessment can give you a false sense of security uh, because the report, the risk report gives you specific numbers which seem to have validity, but they don't necessarily because those numbers are based on guesses in the first place. So just remember garbage in, garbage out. So when it comes to risk assessments, that's something that you might want to do uh, if you understand the problems with it, but you don't need to necessarily do it depending upon your particular situation. Now you must make sure uh, to cover any laws and regulations that are applicable to your company. Uh, so for example, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, most corporations are subject to that. Uh, you might be subject to HIPAA uh, if you are a medical company, or if you are using credit cards, there are special regulations for that. So you need to make sure that any of those that your company needs to abide by are in, in fact included in the security policy. Now in the security policy, you definitely want to include clearly defined roles and responsibilities. So who is it that's in charge of keeping the firewall updated? Who's in charge of, back, of backup? That sort of thing. Next, you want to make sure that you involve management in the creation of the policy. And also make sure that management signs off on the policy. Now, the reason why you want to do this is so that your policy has teeth. Meaning that supposing a security analyst in the IT department writes this policy and puts it out, Users might simply ignore it, but if the president of your company tells people that they must follow this, then it's likely that they will. You want to make sure that your security policy is a high-level document and understandable by all employees. It should be broad as opposed to technology-specific. Writing the policy in this manner has the benefit that the security policy should rarely require updating. Now, based on the security policy, technology-specific procedures can be written. So it's assumed that as time goes on, procedures will need to be rewritten, but the security policy should not. Now, an example of a specific procedure would be what should the person in charge of backup specifically be doing daily to make sure that the backup is done properly. And lastly, you want to make sure to include an acceptable use policy, that's AUP, in the security policy. 
Now, an acceptable use policy is very specific, indicating to end users exactly what they are allowed to do on the network and what they're not allowed to do. Uh, for example, they might be allowed to use um, internet for personal purposes, or maybe they're not allowed to. Likewise with email, are they allowed to use email for personal purposes or not? Or maybe they can use, maybe they're allowed to only use it uh, outside of their shift, that kind of thing. Uh, usually new employees will be required to sign the acceptable use policy uh, you know, at the time that they're being hired to indicate that they understand it and will abide by it. That's the end of step one. We will see you soon in step two. Welcome to step two, educate end users and IT staff. We start with the question, is it more likely that a confidential file will be compromised by hackers from the outside of the company or that an end user will accidentally erase it? Answering this question, will give you an idea as to why end user education is so important. I'll give you a hint. It's more likely the, the end user will accidentally erase it. So we educate all staff on how to most safely conduct themselves to reduce actions that could result in security breaches. No matter how good the technology used to secure the network, actions on the part of both end users and IT staff can result in security breaches. The way to reduce these problems is to educate all staff on how to most safely conduct themselves. Specifically, they should be educated on the acceptable use policy, the security policy itself, and any procedures applicable to their specific job. It's a fact that end users will usually perform their jobs in the easiest way possible, not the most secure. End users are simply not aware that certain of their actions may pose security threats to the organization. Education aims to reduce these security actions. Now we have to understand, of course, that end users most of the time are not thinking about security at all. So education is aimed to get them to think about it. New employees should be required to complete basic security education prior to starting employment. They are most compliant at this time. After completing the initial security training, all employees should be required to complete some sort of refresher security, uh, security training on a regular basis, say once or twice a year. Finally, security policies and procedures should be readily available for all employees to be able to refer to at any time. This allows them to easily clarify questions that may arise during their day-to-day -day routine. That is the end of this video. We'll see you in step three. Question. Is it more likely that a confidential file will be compromised by a black hat by defeating your firewall or by a visitor or black hat walking up to a PC and copying the file onto a thumb drive? In general, the answer is the latter, which underscores why you need to implement physical security. Physical security may seem to be common sense, yet it is often overlooked. If unauthorized people gain access to the physical network infrastructure, lots of other security mechanisms may be rendered useless. Physical access suggests at least the possibility of being able to bypass other security mechanisms. Physical security should be made part of your security policy. So make sure that you write that in. Begin by defining restricted areas and non-restricted areas. Obviously, a server room should be a restricted area. 
network equipment such as routers, firewalls, patch panels, and cabling should be in a restricted area. Backup media or any equipment containing data should also be stored in, in a restricted area. Take appropriate measures to secure all areas. Consider human security guards, various kinds of locks, biometrics, key cards, cameras, or, etc. Visitors should be supervised even when in non-restricted areas. Define who is allowed into restricted areas by following the principle of least privilege. That is, only employees with a legitimate business reason should have access to restricted areas. Consider locking down end user workstations. For example, you may wish to disable the physical USB ports. That would stop the many exploits that use thumb drives, such as an employee taking home files or a visitor plugging in a thumb drive with malware on it to any convenient, convenient computer. Configure workstations with a timed auto logout so no one can sit down at someone else's workstation if the user forgets to log out. Eliminate unauthorized network equipment, that is, rogue equipment. The most common type of unauthorized network equipment will be end users who install a device for convenience or fun not realizing the security problems that this can cause. They don't realize that they could be creating a back door into the network. The first step in dealing with this sort of thing is to make sure that your AUP clearly addresses what is and what is not allowed to be installed on the network and make sure end users are educated about this. In my experience, more technically advanced users seem to pose a bigger problem. Of course, there is also the possibility that rogue equipment may be installed on your network by black hats with the sole purpose of doing harm. Rogue wireless access points deserve special attention. This is a very common type of rogue equipment. The most direct way to find wireless access points is to use a program like Insider to view all SSIDs in the area, specifically unauthorized SSIDs in the area. And last, consider disabling open Ethernet jacks accessible to end users. As most rogue equipment must be plugged in to an Ethernet jack, it will go a long way to preventing the problem. Cisco does allow you to disable ports on switches. That is the end of this video. We will see you soon in step four. Welcome to the lab on Insider. So you can see that we have Insider Office up on the screen here. So what this has to do with, if you recall in the lecture on perimeter security, one of the things that we talked about was rogue access points. So you can use Insider to discover any rogue access points that might be on your network. Now, if you recall what a rogue access point is, is an access point that somebody has put in your network. They basically just plugged it into an Ethernet port on your network, as opposed to you as the network administrator authorizing and installing that access point. So here you can see all the access points or all the SSIDs uh, that are being picked up by my laptop here. So you can see that there's quite a few of them here. And we just go down the, the columns here. So this is the SSID of, of, the, of the device. Uh, you have a signal strength, the channel that it's on, 
the type of security, whether it's open or WPA2 personal uh, or whatever. Here's the MAC address of the access point. And here it tells you whether, whether it's 802.11G or N. Here's a couple of N, here's a G. And then it's going to try and, and figure out what the brand name of the access point is is the way it does that is it looks at the mac address the first half of the mac address is the oui which is unique to a particular vendor so it looks that up if it can and then tells you the the name of it so what we know is that netgear 94 and you notice when i highlight it it appears over here netgear 94 is an access point that i have installed and ringo is an access point that I have installed. So if you notice the way this appears, at the top you have the most, the strongest signals and at the bottom you have the weaker signals. So let's take a look at signal strength and get an idea about that. So if you look at the signal strength here, they have a minus 45 for, for the, and a minus 45 for both, for both the Netgear and, and Ringo. That is a very strong signal strength. These, the signal strength is in that they show here, the unit is dBm. So the way that works, it's basically the signal strength or the wattage the particular access point is, is putting out. And the lower the number, the, the stronger the signal. So minus 45 is a very, very strong signal. You, you're very rarely going to see anything below, say, minus 40. Now, FYI, these minus four, both of these access points are within five feet of me. So that's about the strongest signal that you're pretty much going to see. Now, if you look right here at Sasha's house, that's a minus 56. And... So that's weaker, but still relatively strong. And then you get the farthest away here is a minus 66. Those are the weakest signals. Now, the reason why I'm telling you about signal strength, what, what's going to happen is you're going to say, okay, there are two of these are my access points, but what are the rest of them? Either they belong to a neighbor or they could be a rogue access point. So if they have a high signal strength then they're very close to you. If they have a low signal strength or a high number, then they're far away from you. So minus 66, 65 is about the cutoff point where if you were receiving any less than that, it, it can't be used because the signal strength isn't strong enough. So very often you'll see, you're not seeing it right now, but you'll see like minus 80. If you see any of those, those are so weak that it's very unlikely it's in your building. So you probably don't have to worry about them. But anything that's, that's say, 60 or, or lower is pretty close to you. So you better figure that that could be in your building. So what you're going to do is basically walk around. So... I happen to know that these are not in my building because uh, I have a home office here. But let's say that you wanted to see this Legend Trail guest. So you could highlight that and you can see that you can actually watch this as you're walking around with your laptop to see as you're getting, the number will get lower as you get closer to it. Lower was the strongest signal. So you can actually nail down where these are by walking around with your laptop and watching the signal get stronger or weaker as you walk by. So what you need to do is determine if any of these are actually in your area or on your network by walking around. But this at least gives you all of the laptops that are around and then it's up to you to say, okay, these are mine and these other ones are my neighbors and Potentially, here is one that somebody has just installed. I'll show you one more thing here. So if we look at, this is my wireless access point. So if you look here on, on Amazon, that's $22. And you can see what this thing looks like a little bit. So 
the reason why I'm showing you this is anyone with $22 and the tiniest bit of technical experience could just plug that, that right into an Ethernet port and then use that as a wireless access point. It's, it's a door into your network. So you definitely want to get rid of that. So the most common situation you're going to find is that somebody that works for your company has actually installed this without really thinking too much about it, just for the convenience of it. Of course, there's also the possible situation where a black hat actually came into your office one time, you know, as a, vis as a visitor or something and installed that. That is the end of this lab. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to step four, implement perimeter security. Trusted versus untrusted zones, a most basic concept in perimeter security. The most basic concept in perimeter security is the trusted versus untrusted zones. The trusted zone is everything inside of your network and the untrusted zone is anything outside of your network, that is the internet. Best practice demands that we'll, there will be only one point on the perimeter where data packets can pass in and out. A firewall is placed at this single point. The firewall's job is to stand at the border and regulate specifically what is allowed in and what is allowed out. Keep it simple. Everything inside your firewall is trusted. Everything outside your firewall is untrusted. Consider adding a third zone, the DMZ. The two-zone architecture is generally sufficient for SOHO, small office, home office setups, while businesses that have servers accessible to the public may add a third zone called the DMZ and place the servers in it. Because these servers may be vulnerable to attacks from the untrusted network, communication from the DMZ to the trusted zone is carefully controlled by the firewall. Where's the DMARC? To get internet access, we need to pay an ISP, Internet Service Provider, to provide that connection. Any equipment necessary for the internet connection that is owned by you is called CPE, Customer Premises Equipment. Anything outside of the CPE, of the CPE is owned by the ISP, the internet service provider. The exact connection point is called the DMARC. That is, everything inside of the DMARC is owned by and controlled by you. Anything outside of the DMARC is owned by and controlled by the ISP. The DMARC is important because it specifically defines who is responsible for what. Configure the router. Usually it's the first device where data arrives from the internet. If a packet from the untrusted network to the trusted network arrives, usually the first device it hits is the router at the perimeter. Depending upon the type of internet connection, whether it's T1, cable, or it's, etc., the router may be CPE or it may be owned by the ISP. If the router is CPE, then it is your job to secure it. Securing the router is most often done by using access lists or ACLs. Secure the router with Cisco access lists. Cisco access lists have both standard access lists and extended. Standard ACLs filter solely based on the source IP address of the packet. Extended ACLs offer more functionality. You can filter on source IP address, destination IP address, source port, destination port, 
plus more. So you may decide what source and destination IP addresses and what source and destination ports are allowed to pass the router and then enforce this with an ACL. Secure the router with strong passwords. Logging into the router, make sure that the access to this is properly secured using passwords. Secure the router with the Cisco one-step lockdown feature and the security audit feature. Cisco has two features that help secure their routers. One-step lockdown feature and the security audit feature. You can use one or both of these features in a semi-automated way to secure the router using the guidance provided by Cisco. Now, obviously, you may not have a Cisco router, although the majority probably will based upon the saturation of Cisco in the world. But if you have another router, then you can have similar features based on the brand of router that you have. And lastly, we will configure the firewall. Traffic that is permitted to pass the router next hits the firewall. A firewall is much more granular and powerful a device for controlling traffic in and out than your router. So first we talk about first generation firewall functionality. First generation packet filtering is pretty much the same as the functionality that you get with Cisco standard and extended access lists mentioned above. Packet filtering occurs at, at layers 1, 2, and 3 of the OSI reference model. Second generation firewall functionality, stateful packet filtering. Second generation stateful packet filtering occurs at layers 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the OSI reference model. The addition of layer 4 the transport layer, allows the use of connection state. The firewall will record all connections passing through it. Furthermore, it determines if any packet is part of an existing connection, the start of a new connection, or were not part of any connection at all. Here's an example to help you understand the advantages of stateful packet filtering. A typical default firewall setting would be from untrusted to trusted, deny all traffic, but from trusted to untrusted, allow all traffic. You can leave the firewall configured as above, and then from, the piece, from a PC on your LAN, you would find that you are able to go to any website and it works properly. But wait a minute. In order for the website to work properly, the firewall must pass traffic on your LAN to the website, which is trusted to untrusted, which is allowed, and also from the website to your LAN, which is untrusted to trusted, which is denied. So why doesn't the firewall block so why doesn't the firewall block the ladder? because the firewall knows that the traffic from the website to your LAN is part of an existing connection opened by you. And the firewall is smart enough to assume that this traffic is safe. Now suppose a website on the internet were to try to make a connection to the server, to a server behind your firewall the firewall would stop this traffic as, as it is a new connection. Third generation firewall functionality, application level. Here, filtering occurs at layers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7. The addition of layer 7, the application layer, allows the functionality of deep packet inspection. This allows you to filter by specific criteria for specific applications, such as HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, DNS, etc. 
this allows you to filter based upon almost any criteria in the packet, giving you extremely fine control. Exactly how much fine control you get with the application layer will be dependent upon the specific abilities of that firewall that you're using. And lastly, we look at additional firewall features. In addition to the above first, second, and third generation firewall functionality, many firewalls include other security features, such as VPN capabilities, content filtering, which allows you, which allows you to block end users on your LAN from accessing certain websites, gateway antivirus, intrusion prevention, anti-spyware, and logging and alerts. So even though all of these features are not part of first, second, and third generation firewalls, they are features that many firewalls do give you, and you definitely want to take advantage of those. That is the end of this video. We will see you in step five. Welcome to the first demo on firewalls. So we will be demonstrating a Dell SonicWall firewall here. Now you might ask, why did we choose Dell SonicWall? And uh, the most obvious reason is that I worked for Dell SonicWall for four years, so I'm pretty familiar with this uh, product. Uh, the other reason is they have a very convenient demo site. So you can go and right up to this site and uh, do this along with me or play around with it yourself as much as you like. Uh, and also, I chose this because it's uh, it's GUI-based, graphical-based, as opposed to command-based, like, like the Cisco's. So it's much easier and more intuitive to demonstrate the GUI-based. Anyway, let's, let's keep in mind that the purpose of this demonstration is to learn the general concepts of firewalls, not to learn the specifics of how to, of how to configure this particular firewall. So let's get started. Uh, the first uh, thing you might remember is that we had trusted versus untrusted zones uh, in the lecture. And here you see that they have a WAN zone right here, which is the same as the untrusted zone. And they have a LAN zone, which is the same as the trusted zone. And they even say it right here. Okay, and then you have a DMZ. So those are already, this is just by default that you get these zones. So let's look at the firewall itself. Now, the thing that you want to realize is if you look up here, it says a network security appliance, which is what it is. So there is no such thing nowadays as a, a firewall appliance. They're almost all network security appliance, which has all the functionality of what the older concept of the firewall is, plus a whole lot more. So if you look at the access rules here, and we're in a matrix, then you can see the actual firewall rules. So you can see from LAN to WAN, and we can look at that here, and you can see the access rules from LAN to WAN, or from the inside of your network to the outside, everything is allowed. Now you can add firewall rules right here by just clicking add, and you can go ahead and, and add as many rules as you want. Now if we go click matrix again, then we can look at another one. We can look at WAN to LAN. Now here, they deny everything. So if you think about that, you don't want people on the outside connecting to your, uh, to your network. So that's denied. Now you can add rules here, just like you, just like, uh, you did before. And you could add as many rules as you want. Now you need to realize that, that the order matters. So what it's going to do in any firewall is it's going to start at the top and work down. So if the first rule is deny, it's just going to go ahead and deny it. It's not even going to look further. So if you add rules here, you want to use a priority. After you add the rule, you can use this priority and move them up and down. You want to make sure that any 
any allow rule that you add is going to be before this deny or else it's not going to have any effect. And likewise, we can go back to now to the matrix here and you can see that there, there are other zones here that you can make firewalls uh, rules to also. So if you remember, we spoke about first generation firewall functionality, which was packet filtering, second generation firewall functionality, which was stateful packet filtering. Well, when you configure any of these firewall rules, you get both automatically. Now, if you want the third generation of firewall functionality, which is application level, then you can go to app rules. And you can create app rules here that give you the ability to filter on almost anything that would be inside of the packet. So you can see that you can create here, uh, if you go to app rules, you can uh, add a new policy here and you can create any app rule that you like. Or if you want, if you want the easy way out, so to speak, you can go to app control advanced. Now what they have here is these are app rules that are already configured for you and you can choose to use them or not. So for example, let's let's take this YouTube here. It's under the see that we're under the category of multimedia. If you go to YouTube here and click on configure, you can see is block is disabled. So if you wanted to block YouTube then you just enable that and then you save that and then it'll block YouTube. Uh, now you can you can also log it and all kinds of stuff. Now let's look at some others here. So if we go to peer to peer is a lot of <laughs> there's an awful lot of <laughs> there's an awful lot of dangerous peer to peer apps that you, so you can decide that you want to just block all peer-to-peer. -peer. So you click on here and then you see where it says block disable. You just enable that, save that, and it'll block all peer-to-peer. -peer. So you can see that you can pretty easily block almost any kind of application that you like. That's what application, the beauty of application control. Now if you remember we said that in addition to being a firewall, and a firewall would be basically packet filtering, stateful packet filtering, and application level filtering. In addition to that, there are other services that make it a security appliance. So we can look at our security services here. And under the security services, we'll just go through them. Uh, first one is content filtering. So in content filtering, you can configure this so that different websites are um, that you can block different websites so you can go to policy here and then if you go to the default policy then you see that they have all kinds of categories of websites that you can block so you can choose any of these that you want so they start you off here with stuff that almost any business would want to uh, to block but then you can go ahead and Maybe you want to block job search, or maybe you want to block email, any of these things. So some of these things you're going to block because th there's absolutely no reason to be using them on, on a, uh, at work. Or you might just want to block stuff like, um, you might want to block stuff like humor and jokes just so people don't waste that time. Close that out. Okay, so here's your intrusion prevention service. And what you see here is here's all your policies. Now this is built in and you have the ability here, if you, if you just say enable this, then you're going to get the default, all the default signatures. Okay. Now if you look right here, you can see there's a signature timestamp. So this shows that they are updating your signatures. So these are all the signatures that you have here. So if you go to all categories, uh, each one of these has an awful lot of signatures in it. So you can, 
you see how many signatures you got just on, if you look at this um, ActiveX, these are ActiveX signatures or DNS signatures, whatever. So there's, I don't know, a couple thousand signatures here, I suppose. And pretty much if you just click enable IPS, it's going to do its job, but then you can get much more fine control if you want. Uh, likewise, is similar for anti-spyware. So just it's also signature based. So in the anti-spyware, if you enable that, then you have anti-spyware and you can see that it looks like this 3,400 anti-spyware signatures and you can just accept them all or you can choose to eliminate any signature that isn't working properly for you. That is the end. Welcome to step five. Use good password management. We start by giving you an example of a good password policy. Now you can adjust it to meet the needs of your company. The password policy here would be pretty much middle of the road. So if you need very, very tight security, you could make the uh, requirements of the password policy more strict, or if you wanted, you could make it looser. It's really depending upon the level of security that you need. So the first criteria in any case would be a minimum password length of eight characters. The password must contain upper and lower case characters, at least one non-alphanumeric character, and at least one number. The password must be changed at least every 90 days. When a password is changed, any of the previous passwords may not be reused. Passwords from default accounts must be changed or removed. When a user leaves your company, their accounts and password must be disabled or removed. Password logging that is success or failure should be implemented and users must never share their passwords. Failure to abide by the above defeats the purpose of having passwords in the first place. Enforcing password policy is relatively easy as this functionality is built into most operating systems. Uh, anyone that's done any kind of admin uh, work with uh, Windows certainly uh, has used this feature. Now, enforcement prevents end users from failing to follow the password policy. So, as we've discussed before, end users will often do the most convenient thing rather than the most secure thing. So, it's much, much easier for them to just choose a simple dictionary word and never change it. Therefore, we must enforce it to make sure that they follow good policy. Also, most operating systems allow for password logging, and that's probably something that you want to enable. Now, you should realize that no OS can completely enforce a password policy. It can't prevent users from sharing passwords or writing a password on a sticky note behind a monitor. This sort of thing needs to be included in the company's security policy and in end user education. Realize that strong passwords are not vulnerable to brute force dictionary attacks, which is one of the main reasons why you want to use them. If data is encrypted and protected by a password, there are two ways for a black hat to try and view the data unencrypted. The first is to try to break the algorithm or the encryption algorithm. The wireless algorithm WEP, WEP, is relatively easy to crack with tools readily available on the internet. So any admin that knows what he's doing would never use WEP, but if they did, that would be, the, that would be easy to crack the algorithm. Now, many algorithms, such as AES, which is the current government uh, standard, is virtually impossible to crack the algorithm. In these cases, black hats will use a dictionary attack. A dictionary attack is a type of brute force attack 
that uses a dictionary file with literally millions of words in it. The attack simply tries each password one at a time until it finds the correct password. Depending upon the speed of your computer, this could be done uh, relatively quick, quickly. Here's an example of how weak passwords can take an otherwise strong security and weaken it, allowing hackers to compromise. Wi-Fi WPA2 is considered extremely difficult to break the algorithm. But using Kali Linux, which is freely available, does not cost any money it's because it's, it's open source, uh, a reasonably savvy hacker can launch a dictionary attack and crack a, a dictionary password in, say, five minutes. The same hacker would be stopped cold by a good password. It doesn't matter how strong your armor is when you have a crack in the armor where the opponent can plunge his sword. That's the end of step five. We will see you in the next lecture on unnecessary services. So we start with the question, what is a service? If there is a public web server, that server needs to be listening on the HTTP service in order for remote clients to be able to connect to it. Similarly, if there is a public DNS server, that server needs to be listening on the DNS service in order for remote clients to connect to it. When we say a server is listening on a specific service, we mean that we, it will allow remote clients to connect to that specific service. If a server is not listening on a specific service, then a remote client tries to connect to that service, the server will ignore the request and the connection will fail. There is a well-known port for each specific service. The complete list can be found on www.iana.org and it's called Service Name and Transport Protocol Port Number Registry. Yeah, it's really called that. Service names and port numbers are used to distinguish between different services that run over transport protocols such as TCP and UDP. So what are some common well-known ports? FTP, ports 20 and 21, SSH, port 22, Telnet, port 23, SMTP, port 25, DNS, port 53, TFTP, port 69, HTTP port 80, POP3 port 110, NetBIOS port 137, 138, and 139, and HTTPS port 443. Now, if you work with ports and services, if you work with TCP IP at all, then these well-known ports should pretty much be memorized. You need to pretty much know these. So this is a good list to start with, but just by working with them, you will get to know them if you haven't worked with them much before. So when we say a server is listening on a service, that's the same as saying that the port for that service is opened. The rule is only have open ports for services that are necessary. A black hat must take advantage of an open port on a server in order to be able to connect to that server if they're looking to do harm to the server. Therefore, the rule is only have open ports for services that are necessary. Having open ports on a server for services that are not necessary is simply making a black hat's job easier where they can connect to the server and do bad things to that server. Use the commands specific to the server OS to make sure only necessary ports are opened. 
So each OS has specific uh, has specific commands that you can use, so you can see what ports are opened and not, and also how do you actually open a port or close a port. You will use those commands. You can also use a firewall to drop packets on unnecessary ports before the packet actually gets or to the server at all. That is the end of step six. We will see you soon in step seven. Welcome to step seven, implement good patch management. Don't find yourself in this position. You say to your boss one day, our network is down because a vulnerability was compromised by a black hat. Your boss says, that sounds serious. Is there a patch for the vulnerability due out soon? You answer, well, a patch came out around a month ago, but I hadn't gotten a chance to apply it yet. Your boss says, expletive deleted. When a black hat attempts to compromise a host, they are often looking for a known vulnerability on that host. A vulnerability is any flaw or weakness on the host that is, for example, in an application or on the operating system that can be exploited. New vulnerabilities are discovered daily and vendors publish patches to fix the vulnerability. Make sure that all applicable patches are applied to your network as quickly as possible after they are published. That is what good patch management is all about. So let's talk about a good patch management procedure. Step one, identify patches made available by vendors. Step two, identify the hosts on your network that need these patches. Step three, download the patches. Step four, test the patches on a system on your network. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, you never know if you deploy a patch, if that patch could actually cause harm to the workstation. So, if this is an important server that you're putting that patch on, you better test it in some way before you subject your network to uh, to a possible problem. And the last step is deploy patches that that test okay on all hosts on your network that need the patches. Now for larger networks, you're going to use an automated software that performs the above tests. So they, there are several pieces of software that, that you can purchase that are specifically for patch management. That is the end of this lecture. We'll see you in the next lecture. And welcome to the lab on NetStat. Now, if you recall in the lecture, we wanted to make sure, obviously, that you had no open ports or unnecessary open ports on any servers that you own. So it's easy enough to check that out on any server that you have using the built-in DOS command netstat. So on any kind of a Windows server, you're going to find this. There's nothing to install. And I suppose there's similar commands on Linux boxes that you could use the same principles. So here we have a little cheat sheet for the netstat command. And if you do, so the minus A is displays all connections and listening ports. Minus N displays addresses and port numbers in numerical form. And minus F uh, displays the FQDN with a fully qualified domain name. So in general, you're going to run the netstat command with the minus A N P. It's the easiest way to do it. And if you want to just see TCP, where, which is obviously the only connection-oriented protocol of these three, then you can use that. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now, th this is actually a workstation and not a server 
which would be the more common use of it. But uh, so just just bear that in mind with the results that we get. So this this that we're looking at here is a Windows a Windows Seven professional workstation. So if we run the uh, the command netstat minus a n p minus t c p, you can see what ports we are listening on. So we're listening on 135, which is uh, NetBIOS, 445, which is HTTPS, and etc. So you can see that it's listening on these. It's not giving you any kind of an address here. Uh, and, and you can see that th there's an established connection to something here. And these are actually saying that it's closed. So now... Right now, I'm not connected to any to any websites or anything like that. So let's go ahead and open up a uh, open up a web browser here. Okay, so now we're connected to this website, which is this is my website here, and we'll just close this out. And now we'll just go ahead and we'll clear this. And we'll run the command again. Now look how much more stuff that you have. So you can see that we're still listening on the same ports, but now it's showing a bunch of established connections. So let's see. So we notice here that we're still listening on the same ports, but now we have some established connections. So if you look at the established connections here, these are all high numbered ports. In other words, then they're, they're not well known ports like port 80 for HTTP or or uh, you know port 21 and 22 for FTP. They're high numbered, which means that I am connected to a server. If you looked at the server, then it would show like port 80 or port 445 for HTTPS. But if you look at a workstation, it chooses these at random. So that's what you'll, what you'll end up seeing. That is the end of this lab. Thank you very much. Welcome to the lab on Nmap. We are here at the Nmap webpage, nmap.org. And you can see that you can download Nmap for free right from here. So that's uh, the idea of these labs is to allow you to be able to do them along with us or, or do them afterwards. So being that it, this is free, that kind of meets that goal. And if you look here, it says Nmap is a free and open source utility for network discovery and security auditing. Uh, basically what it is, it's a scanning tool. Now, specifically, we are going to be use it as a, using it as a port scanner so we can see on our servers what ports are opened to assure that we don't have unnecessary ports opened on our servers. Now, Nmap can do quite a bit more than this, and uh, I do recommend that you take a look at, at it and play around with it. But for, our, for the lab, that's all we're going to be doing. So I have already downloaded it and it's installed on my computer. It's a very, very quick process. Uh, here you can see I have a little bit of a cheat sheet up here. Uh, so Nmap is very, very, the syntax of this couldn't be simpler. It's, it's just like Nmap and the IP address of the server that you want to, that you want to scan. So here you can see that these all have the uh, 192.168. So those are private IP addresses. So that's what it'll generally look like if you're scanning, if you're on your own network, scanning your own uh, server on your network. Now you see that there's a couple of other options here. You have minus SS and you have minus ST. And if you're interested in using those, then go ahead and you can read through this just a bit. But for the demonstration, this will be sufficient to use. So let's go ahead and get to that demonstration. I'll go ahead and close this out. And Nmap, you just run it from the command prompt. So I'm going to Nmap my website. Now, it'll be smart enough to, you can either enter in the website 
or you can enter in the IP address. Either way, it's going to work. So we just enter it here, let it sit for a minute, and it's checking it out. Now it has to go through every, it goes through every single port. There it is, it's finished. So what, what do we see here? There are only four ports open, port 21, FTP, port 22, SSH, port 80, HTTP, and port 443, HTTPS. That's pretty much what you would expect to see, uh, the, the open ports that you would expect to see on a web server. Now, I don't own this web server. It's my website, but it's it's hosted. So uh, my hosting company has set up the security on this. And so I can see that they're doing a pretty good job for me. Now, what we can also do, we could do nmap 8.8.8.8. Now, that is Google's DNS server that a lot of people use. I don't know if it's considered public or not, but a lot of people use it as a DNS server. So out of curiosity, let's see what ports are opened on Google's DNS server. Okay, that's it. So you can see in real time how long it took and what port, there is one port opened. 999 are filtered ports and 50 and port 53 is opened so that's really really good tight security because it's dns server port 53 is the well-known port for dns so that would have to be opened or you couldn't use it as a dns server it also shows that there are 999 filtered ports Usually that means that there's a firewall in front of it. That's when you see filtered ports. But the important thing is that you only see the one port opened. So if you do a scan against your own server, you could either do it from the internet or if it's or you can do it directly on your network. Either way, you should see just the necessary ports. If you see a whole bunch of ports that are opened, then you need to go to work and figure out how to close those up for best security. That is the end of this lab. Thank you very much. Welcome to the lab on patch management. In the lecture, we had discussed the theory and what patch management is all about. So here I'm going to show you a concrete example so you can get a little better idea. So this is the Landesk Security Suite, which is a pretty popular, pretty popular software and that would be installed onto a server on your network. Uh, so one part of the Landesk security suite is patch management, which you can see right here. So we go ahead and select that and see what it's all about. So let's see what they say here. Automate your manual patching process and cut IT staff time by 35%. Well, I don't know if uh, the 35% is accurate, but uh, certainly I could believe that. So let's see what it does. So it says, what is Landesk patch management? Keeping up with the constant stream of security threats and patches is an ongoing drain on IT staff. Landesk patch management evaluates tests and applies patches across the enterprise and automatically uh, drastically simplifies your efforts. Remediate thousands of systems with one task without saturating your network. So that's the overview of it. So basically, you're not going to be doing this by hand. It's going to pretty much do it for you. And the key thing is that you'll be able to see uh, on a screen specifically which, uh, which ones of your workstations are fully patched and which ones may need patching. So what do you get here? You get operating system patching, so it maintains Microsoft Windows, uh, and then you have third-party application patching, so Java, Adobe, et cetera, multiple browsers. So, you know, you can pretty much get an automatic patching, a Windows patching, but that doesn't cover any of this stuff. And you have distributed and remote patching, so it patches all devices anywhere across your network, whether they're on the road, 
at remote sites or asleep. So that's going to save you a heck of a lot of time, uh, specifically with all of your uh, road warriors out there. It's not that easy to get patches on there if the computers, if their workstation is not always connected. Uh, and what I mentioned already is visibility and control. So you're going to gain complete visibility on all patches, on every device, anywhere, in, anywhere on your network. So you can see what's going on here at a glance to see what needs patching and what doesn't. And it's patch automation and distribution, which is basically what the whole thing is about. And you get one, uh, one heterogeneous platform for whether it's Windows, Red Hat, or Mac OS, any of those operating systems. So you can um, download a white paper here if you want to get more information. And there's actually little videos, sort of advertising videos, but it gives you an idea. And you can actually download the product trial uh, and play with this thing if you like. Uh, so... If, just remember when you download the product trial, there isn't a specific product called Patch Manager, but it's part of their security suite. Uh, that is the end of this lab. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to Step 8, where we implement antivirus measures. When we refer to antivirus, we usually mean not just viruses, but all malware which includes viruses, worms, and trojans. To protect against malware on end-user workstations, each workstation should have antivirus software installed on it. To protect against malware on servers, each server should have antivirus software installed on it. The antivirus software that you install on servers may be specific to that particular type of server and is generally different than the antivirus software installed on the end user workstations. To protect all hosts from malware, you can enable gateway antivirus on your firewall to eliminate the malware prior to it ever hitting your hosts. Note that gateway antivirus is not a substitute for host-based antiviruses that we refer to above. Be constantly vigilant that you have the latest virus signatures. Antivirus protection is similar to patch management in that there is new malware discovered daily and antivirus vendors push new antivirus signatures daily to defend against a specific piece of malware. So, it is not enough to simply have antivirus software installed on a host, but the host also needs to have the latest signatures on it to defend against the latest malware. For Soho systems, this is relatively easy. You simply install antivirus software on your PCs. Most antivirus software upgrades its signatures automatically. And if you periodically double check that the signatures are up to date, then you're probably okay. For enterprise networks, use centralized antivirus management software. What if it is your job to protect a large corporation with a couple of thousand workstations? How can you make sure that all the workstations have antivirus installed on them? And, in addition, that they have the latest signatures. You need to use a centralized antivirus management software, such as McAfee ePolicy Orchestrator. Using this type of software, you can see every workstation on your network, if each workstation has antivirus software installed, and if each workstation has the latest signatures, and if not, how old they are. As pushing signatures can be resource intensive, you can schedule signature updates to occur outside of business hours. Decide how to handle workstations with out-of-date signatures. If you view a workstation that has out-of-date signatures, you can update them manually. Or 
software can be configured so that if antivirus protection does not meet minimum criteria, that workstation is quarantined from the network until such time as it is upgraded to meet the, minim the minimum criteria. This is referred to as enforced antivirus and can be configured in most typical firewalls. Laptops can be challenging. Note that laptops used by road warriors present more of a challenge to keep protected. For example, the laptop may not even be on the network at the time when the latest signatures are pushed. That is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to the lab on antivirus. So in the lecture, we had seen some of the basic ideas or principles of antivirus. So now we're going to look at a sonic wall network security appliance or firewall that um, to see concrete examples. Uh, once again, the idea of this is not to get to understand all the details of setting up a sonic wall, but to see in general the types of what you what you have in security appliances to deal with antivirus. Now the sonic wall has two completely separate types of antivirus. So the first one is client AV enforcement. This is probably the less popular one used. And what this does is it allows you to push antivirus software onto, on, onto your workstations. And then if in fact the workstation does not have the proper antivirus or the latest signatures, then it doesn't let it get onto the network. So that's why it's called enforced AV. So basically you have, you have an antivirus software installed on every workstation on the workstation, on each workstation itself, but it has to go through the firewall, and the firewall will not let any antivirus will will not let uh, any computer onto the network that doesn't have the proper antivirus protection as you define it. So what you see here is that this is the client AV enforcement, and you actually have two choices. You can either use McAfee or K Kaspersky. Uh, in in the demo here, they obviously show it's not licensed for the McAfee. This is you would use one or the other. So in this in the demo, they're showing you that you have Kaspersky is licensed for five users. So in other words, you would use this to push uh, to push antivirus protection onto those five computers, and if any one of them didn't uh, didn't have it, then they would be blocked. So the way you would do that is if you go to manage licenses here. If this was a real firewall and not a demo, then you would be able to log in here. You could actually set up the uh, antivirus to be pushed to the uh, to be pu to be pushed to the workstations. But if we come back here, you can see how once that's done, you can see how easy this is to set up. So uh, what you have here is this is the enforcement list. So you would come over to here and you could create a group and then put all your computers that you want to have the antivirus enforced on. You'd put them into a group here and that would enforce it. And meanwhile, you, you have an excluded list. So if there was any computers that you didn't want to have antivirus on, like maybe a server that had its own antivirus, then you would put them into, into the group. And now we can look at the other more popular type of antivirus, which is gateway antivirus. So let's wait for this to come up. Here it is. So on gateway antivirus, that's very different than what we just looked at. Because here, you're going to have your virus signatures are going to be in the firewall itself. They're not going to be on your workstations. So essentially... If you enable this right here, you just click enable, then it's going to take all of the signatures that here and before anything from the outside world can get to your workstation, it's going to have to, you know, it's going to have to pass through the firewall. And if the firewall has a signature, then it's going to block a specific piece of malware. 
so you can see here that you have 21,000 signatures, okay? And what's going to happen is, if you, assuming you have a subscription, if you license for this, then you have a timestamp. You can see today's actually the 6th, uh, April 6th. So you can see that it updates automatically every day to give you the latest virus signatures. So what you have, then you can go ahead and if there's any particular signatures that are causing you a problem, like you're getting false positives, you could actually go in and disable it just like that. So if there's any one or two particular signatures. And here you actually get a chance to do some other, a little bit more in-depth uh, filtering. So you could go to like settings of HTTP and you could restrict transfer of zip files and things like that, which is certainly not antivirus. It's, those aren't viruses or you can restrict certain types of traffic from going past. So this is not 100% antivirus, but it, it comes along as a feature with that, with the ga gateway antivirus. So the thing you want to realize is even with gateway antivirus, you still want to have antivirus installed on the particular computer and not just the gateway antivirus. So the gateway antivirus gives you this two levels of protection, which is defense and depth, which is what you always want to aim towards. So that's the end of this lab. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to the lab on McAfee ePolicy Orchestrator or McAfee EPO for short. The general purpose, as we discussed in the lecture, is to administer your antivirus protection for a large enterprise. So this is not the sort of thing that you would purchase if you just had like five workstations to protect. Now, I worked for a company a couple of years back where I was the security admin and I did use ePolicy Orchestrator to administer our antivirus and I was responsible for about 1,200 workstations in about 50 different offices. So a tool like this is certainly necessary. You'd go out of your mind if you tried to do it by hand. So if we look at the components, it says it has these major functions. Manages and deploys products, enforce policies on your endpoints, distributes McAfee software, including new products, upgrades, and patches, and reports on your enterprise network security. So essentially that's everything you need to do to make sure that all of your workstations are protected. Not only workstations, actually it can do servers. And the idea is that you can have a console that, that makes very clear which workstations are covered and which are not. You can divide them into groups and you could, or you can look at them individually and get a view as to what's going on in terms of what workstations are covered, which ones are not. Do you have the latest signatures downloaded, etc. So let's look at the diagram here and it kind of gives you an idea. So first of all, if you look at this EPO server here, this is McAfee's website right here and you have a server inside your building that's going to be talking to that so it obviously has to keep pulling the signatures and updates from there and here you have a SQL database which you can use which obviously is going to make sense because you're going to be pulling a lot of a lot of data to be stored so you might want to put that on a SQL database here is your web console this is where the admin is going to sit to see all the workstations and uh, to see what's been, you know, what you have downloaded, etc. Uh, that's browser based, so you can pretty much uh, see this from anywhere. And if you look right here, you have agent handlers. So what does that mean is you have an agent that's going to be installed on every workstation that you need to have your antivirus on. That agent is what feeds the data to your console so you can see the status of, of each uh, individual workstation. 
And the other thing they have here is distributed depositories. So like in my case where I had 50 offices, you could in fact have a distributed repository so that if you had a, a remote site in, in say, Texas and your main office was in New York, you would have a, a repository for the signatures right in Texas, or each office that you have doesn't have to pull your data across the internet, which would be less efficient. So that gives you a basic idea of what this does. I mean, we could sit here for, you know, the next two days to just to give you all the details. But if you want, you can go ahead and read through this manual. But if you go to the McAfee website on EPO, they have several fairly good videos on how to use the whole thing. My opinion of those videos is that they're OK, but not excellent. But take a look. That is the end of this lab. Thank you. Welcome to step nine, implement access control. We start with permissions. What are permissions? What an end user is allowed to do on the system depends upon the account used and what that account has been configured to allow the user to do. Most operating systems allow very granular control as to what a particular account is allowed to do. Configure accounts to allow users the access rights necessary to perform their job, but no more. This, if you recall, is the principle of least privilege. Access rights consist of an account's ability to access files and directories. If access is granted to a file, is the account allowed to change the file or only read it? If access is granted to a directory, is the account only allowed to read the contents of the directory, or are they allowed to create new files in the directory, etc.? Creating these rights on a Linux or Windows OS is a very basic admin function. So we won't go into the specifics here. For ease of administration, assign rights to groups of accounts rather than to individual accounts. You should create groups of employees with a similar job function and then assign specific rights to the group. For example, all junior accountants will get a specific set of, of permissions, while all senior account accountants will get a different and probably more permissive set of permissions. All admin assistants will get a specific set of permissions applicable to their job duties, etc. Remote access permissions need to be considered carefully. That is, if Huckleberry is allowed a specific set of permissions if he is sitting in the home office, is he allowed those very same permissions if he is sitting at home or if he's sitting in a hotel room or Starbucks? For ease of use, many companies will allow Huckleberry to have the same or similar permissions wherever they're physically located, but you should carefully consider the security implications to, prior to granting such permission. The reason why you would hesitate to grant the same permissions from a remote location than you would from your company location is that the security of the remote site is unknown. If you plan to allow an end user access from a potentially insecure lo location to data on your network, you should use a VPN. A VPN provides secure communication over an insecure public network. So what, what's going to happen is the data that goes back and forth will be encrypted. Now there are two types of VPNs, site-to-site -site VPNs and client-based VPNs. What we're talking about here is client-based VPNs. Here a piece of software is installed on the end user's laptop. This allows the remote user to establish a VPN from his laptop 
to the security appliance that sits on your home network. The important thing to realize is that the VPN allows all data between the laptop and the remote network to be tunneled and therefore encrypted. So you don't really care if the local connection is secure or not, because even if the data could be sniffed by a black hat, he would not be able to decipher the encrypted data. Also, make sure that the VPN is enforced, meaning that the end user is unable to connect to the home office unless the data is, perfect, is protected by the VPN. That is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to step 10, secure data in transit. When data is transferred across an insecure medium, you risk the data may be sniffed by black hats. So encrypt it. When we say sniffed, we mean that it's captured. So they could use a program like Wireshark or many, many other utilities to capture that data so they can look at it. Now, an insecure medium uh, means the internet or in the, the air in the case of uh, Wi-Fi. To secure the data, the sender must encrypt it while it is crossing the insecure medium, and then it must be decrypted by the receiver. Cryptology is the science of concealing information from others. In cryptology, we deal with plain text, which is the same as clear text, which is, which is data that can easily be read by anybody. We encrypt the data into ciphertext, which makes it difficult to read by others. Hopefully, very difficult. Ciphertext can be decrypted to get back the original clear text. Cryptology allows us to achieve different security goals. Confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. Confidentiality means keeping the information secret. Integrity means ensuring that the data has not been altered in transit. Authentication means proving identity. Non-repudiation means a party cannot deny that they sent a specific message. Non-repudiation is probably the least intuitive of these, so we can give an example of that. Uh, supposing a, uh, a person uh, sends an email to buy a stock, uh, and then that's, you know, an hour later that stock tanks. Well, then that person might say, well, I never sent you an email to buy it. Non-repudiation means that it can be proved that they actually did send that order to buy that stock. Secure data with a site-to-site -site VPN. Now, a site-to-site -site VPN allows two networks to communicate securely over the public internet. Suppose a company has an office in New York and an office in Los Angeles. A security appliance is configured at each end and all data going between the offices must pass through the security appliance before it reaches the internet. Therefore, any user communicating with the other office will have his data automatically encrypted for transfer. Secure data with a client-based VPN. Here, a piece of software is installed on the end user's PC. This allows the remote user to establish a VPN from his laptop to the security appliance on their home network. When we say home network, we don't mean a home where you live, but the home office, you know, the, the main office. The VPN allows all data between the laptop and the remote network to be tunneled and therefore encrypted. So you really don't care if the local connection is secure or not, because even if the data could be sniffed by a black hat, they would not be able to decipher the encrypted data and thus would not be able to read it. Take steps to secure your Wi-Fi 
with WPA2, personal or enterprise. Anytime Wi-Fi is used, there is the potential that the RF signal, radio frequency signal, could be sniffed by a black hat who was able to receive that signal. Wi-Fi is inherently more insecure than wired transmission because the RF signal could be picked up by somebody sitting outside the building. WPA2 is built into wireless access points specifically for the purpose. Earlier versions of Wi-Fi, uh, the security was WPA and WEP, which are now pretty much obsolete, insecure, and should not be used. WPA2 comes in two flavors. Personal, which uses a pre-shared key. All uses having the same pre-shared key. Enterprise, which uses a radius server. Each uh, user has a unique key. So what we find is that personal is easier to set up. Enterprise is more difficult to set up, but more secure, at least more secure for enterprise environments. Secure web transactions. If you are buying something on the internet and you must send credit information or credit card information from your PC to the vendor server, obviously this needs to be secure. SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, is built into your browser and allows a secure connection from your PC to the vendor server. Most websites that exchange confidential user information automatically protect the session using SSL. So there is nothing special to install. You just need to verify that it is being implemented when you need it. That is the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the lab on VPNs. So we're going to be demonstrating both the global VPN, which is or client-based VPN, and site-to-site -site VPNs. We're going to be demonstrating both of those on the sonic wall to give you a, a more concrete idea as to how this all works. The, uh, the idea of this is not to give you the specifics to set it up on the sonic wall, but to give you a general understanding so that you could set this up on, a, on any firewall. So let's start with the global VPN, as SonicWall calls it, or the client-based VPN. So the first step would actually be to download that VPN client. You can download it right here from the, from, from the SonicWall website. You could download a 64-bit Windows version or a 32-bit Windows version. And then you would go ahead and install that onto the laptop that you wanted to access the client-based VPN. Then you go to the Sonic Wall, and this here, this WAN Group VPN, that's your client-based VPN. So first of all, you would need to enable that, but it's not going to it's not going to let you save it on the demo. But you enable that, and then you would go to the configuration. And this is the shared secret that they're going to have to enter uh, on the other side, you know, at the client end. They'd have to enter that to, uh, to get access to the VPN. You can use this one here. You can make your own. And then you have proposals. So essentially for the global VPN, you can pretty much use what's here. Or you might want to make it a little stronger. They give you a triple des. I like uh, AES-256. It's a little stronger. So I would probably go with that, although it's probably not too important one way or another. Now, on the Advanced tab, probably want to enable NetBIOS, which allows the, uh, the Global VPN to make use of NetBIOS if, across the VPN if they need to, and also accept multiple proposals from clients. If you don't check this, you could sometimes you can end up with compatibility issues. And the last tab is the client tab. So this here never you generally want to that's the, the more the more secure method, you probably want to go with that. And then this allow connections too, you generally want to use split tunnels. 
if you choose this gateway only, it'll eliminate the laptop's internet access. They'll only be able to get internet through the VPN. So unless you want that, which you're going to choose split tunnels. So once again, on the advanced tab, you notice that there's a group here called trusted users. So it requires authentication um, and they have to be in the trusted users group. So the last part of this would be to actually on the Sonic wall, you would put that particular user into the trusted users group for all this to work. That's a little beyond the scope of, of, of this lab to show you that, but that's relatively easy to do. That's really the end of the client-based VPN. That's how you would set it up. And now we'll go to the site-to-site -site VPN. So if you remember, a site-to-site -site VPN is from one office to another office. Any, uh, any workstation in, in Office A can connect with any workstation in Office B, and all of that will, be, will go through a VPN and be tunneled and encrypted. So the way you set up the site-to-site -site VPN is you come over here and you click on Add. And then you're going to set up these four tabs here, and they're going to pretty much be opposite on the other on the other end. So, in order to set this up, there would be a sonic wall on your end, and then a sonic wall somewhere else in another city or across town or wherever, and you would set up a similar. You would set this up on their end also. So. You can put any name that you like, and then this is going to be the uh, the WAN IP address you're going to put of of the remote location you'll you'll put in here. And if you had if you had two WAN IPs, you you would you could enter it there. Then you have a sh some shared secret, so you're going to enter the same shared secret on both Sonic walls. Enter whatever you like, but it should be strong. And if you go to the network choose a local network. So if you choose a LAN primary subnet, LAN primary subnet means that anything on, that's on your LAN will be able to talk on the VPN to the, to the other side. You could tighten this down and make and only allow certain uh, workstations, but this is the generally you, uh, the most commonly used. And then here, you're gonna enter the remote network so you're going to create an address object uh, for that, and, the, and you're going to enter in the private IP address of the remote network here. So it's a little tricky. It's not the public, but the private goes in here. Then proposals, you can essentially choose whatever you want. The key here is that they need to be the same on both sonic walls on each end. Well, once again, I like to go with a little stronger, a little stronger than triple des, but that's fine. And then you go to the advanced, and in general, you're going to enable the keep alive only on one side. Once again, you're going to enable NetBIOS. You, it, in case you need that, it's going to work. It can't hurt to, to put that in. So basically, you're going to set this up on each end of the, of the you know, on the sonic wall on each end. And that's pretty much all you need to do. That should get you a site-to-site -site VPN up and running. Now, this doesn't actually let us see it because this demo version of, that we're on here doesn't let you save anything. But you would see the name, that, you'd see the, uh, the uh, number three here when you were, uh, after you had set that up. That is the end of this lab. Thank you very much for watching. This is step 11, IDS and IPS. IDS equals Intrusion Detection Service, which is designed to detect malicious actions that might occur on the network. IPS is Intrusion Prevention Service, which is designed to prevent malicious actions from occurring on our network. For modern implementations, we almost always deal with IPS, which prevents malicious actions and also logs each incident where malicious action has been prevented.
So we will not deal with IDS here. IPS can be either network-based, NIPS, or host-based, HIPS. Network-based monitors the entire network for malicious traffic by analyzing all TCP IP traffic entering the network. Host-based, HIPS, monitors a single host for malicious activity, usually for unauthorized changes. NIPS requires that IPS be installed on an appliance at the network perimeter, such as on a firewall. HIPS requires that IPS be installed on every host that requires protection. Usually it's only installed on specific servers. IPS detection can be signature-based or anomaly-based. With signature-based, there will be one signature for every exploit that it is capable of preventing. The signature works by zeroing in on some unique aspect of the particular exploit that is always present for that exploit. With anomaly-based, the system looks for signs of abnormal traffic and assumes that the abnormal traffic is malicious. Both signature-based and anomaly-based systems have their pros and cons. Signature-based pros, low false positives. Signature-based cons can only detect exploits for which a signature exists, so signatures must constantly be updated. Anomaly-based pros does not need to be constantly updated. Anomaly-based cons, high false positives. Most modern IPS are primarily signature-based employed in a physical security appliance. And this is recommended for the needs of the majority of networks. Signature-based IPS can be deployed in a physical security appliance, such as a firewall, that sits on the perimeter of your network. You will need to obtain a subscription from the vendor to keep your signatures up to date. Generally, the signatures update automatically on a daily basis, similar to that of antivirus. That is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, welcome to the lab on IPS. We're going to give you a real-world demonstration of how IPS looks using the SonicWall as an example. So once again, we're not interested specifically in learning how the SonicWall works, but to see this in general, the, the general idea should carry through to any other appliance. So on the SonicWall, in order to, in, to see the IPS, we go to Security Services, and then we choose, choose intrusion prevention. And here you can either enable it or disable it. So if it's enabled here, then it's pretty, it's pretty much ready to go. So if this is enabled, then you do have intrusion prevention working and it's going to test everything that passes through the SonicWall against these signatures. So you can see that you have about uh, 5,000 signatures here. So an, another thing to notice is that you have a signature timestamp. So it means that the last time signatures were downloaded was yesterday. Today is the, is the seventh. So pretty much every day you're going to get new signatures from SonicWall, assuming you're licensed and you're, and you're, you know, you're paying for it. So there's another thing here. If you, if you don't want to accept the defaults, you can, you can adjust this a little bit to, your, to suit your needs. So what they do is each one of these signatures is either, they rate it as either high priority, medium priority, or low priority. So if you look here at, at this one signature, you know, at these signatures here, these are all mediums. But if you scroll through, you'll see some that are high 
and some that are low. So the folks over at SonicWall are saying that if it's a high priority, then that's a very dangerous attack. And if it's low priority, then it's not very dangerous. So by checking these, you can prevent and detect high, medium, or low as you like. So if you, anything under prevent means it will actually stop it. Anything under detect means that it will log it, but not actually stop it. So if you, if you don't want to deal with, with low priorities, then you can just uncheck that. Now, you might want to do that because low priorities attacks can sometimes cause false positives. Another thing you might want to do is you might want to st start out with prevent all and detect all and just see how, how much of a nuisance it is. You might have a lot of, of end users complaining that they can't do this and that. So what you might want to do to prevent that would be to do it like this. So you, you're not going to actually prevent them prevent low priorities, but you're going to detect low priorities, which means it'll log it. Then you can look at the logs, and based upon what you see, you can make a decision as to how you want to set this up in the future. Uh, now, the only other thing that you might want to do is sometimes you find a particular signature is causing a, a problem for you. It's a, it's a false positive. So you can disable any signature that you like. So let's just go to, say, oh, NetBIOS. So if this particular if this particular signature was causing you a problem, then disable it from from here. So that's a little bit of information, give you an idea as to how IPS works in general. That is the end of this video. Thank you very much for watching your data. It's not a question of if you will lose your data, but when. As the old adage says, it's not a question of if you will lose your data, but when. So it should be obvious that data needs to be backed up so it can be recovered if lost. Failure to do this is just plain dumb. Choose a solution that backs up automatically. There are a number of backup strategies, but in each case, the question you must ask yourself is, if a specific piece of data is lost, will I be able to to restore it quickly? If the answer is no, then that particular strategy will cause you sleepless nights. That said, you want a solution that backs up automatically without having to remember to do it and lets you know if the backup is not running properly. We will describe three possible backup strategies here. The first is enterprise solutions. An example would be Backup Exec by Symantec. Backup Exec has been around for over 10 years. With this strategy, there is a single console through which you can control which servers to back up, what data on each server to back up, and how often it should be backed up. You should keep in mind if backups are on local media, that media needs to be stored off-site on a regular basis. You will generally only want to backup servers, not workstations. Therefore, important data should not be stored on workstations. Second is Soho Solutions. An example would be Mosey Home designed to back up one or several workstations. Easily configure the files you want to back up. Backup is automatically saved to Mosey in the cloud. And the third is imaging solutions. An example would be Norton Ghost. The first two solutions generally back up data but not the programs installed and configured on a particular workstation. With imaging software, you take a snapshot of a specific workstation. So if the workstation crashes, you can, re you can quickly recover all installed software and configuration. 
Now, if you've ever had your computer crash, then you can see the necessity for a pro for an imaging solution, because once you get your data back, then you still have to install and configure all of your applications, which if it was imaged, you would save all that time. That is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to the demonstration on Symantec Backup Exec. So the idea of this, if you recall in the lecture, we had discussed the importance of backing up your data. So if you have a an enterprise level network, then Backup Exec is an extremely good choice. So we're just going to go over a few of the high points so you get an idea as to what it's all about. So I'm, I'm at the Symantec.com uh, webpage, and they have a little diagram here. So if you install Backup Exec and backup from local or remote source, so it's showing you here that you, that you have quite a few choices of what you can back up. And you can back up to all of these media. So you could back up to disk, tape, clients, or to the cloud. So really, you're going to take your data and you can put it almost anywhere that you like. In the old days, everything was done to tape. But if remember, if you're going to go to tape, that you want to store those tapes off-site for, for the best security. And also, they're showing you here that you can restore an entire server, and ent an entire virtual machine, entire applications and databases. So what they're saying here is that not only can you back up and restore files, but you can back up and restore an entire server. And this is this is important because obviously you have applications and things that are set up in a certain way. You might not want that to be lost if you were just backing up files. So. We can look here um, at the admin guide that Symantec gives you, and they give you a little thing as to how does backup exec work. So it has the following features, convenient backup and scheduling. So like we said, that's, that's the main thing here is that you're going to be able to schedule things to be backed up as opposed to having to remember to back them up. So if you read here, it says backup exec administrators can set up scheduled backups for Windows and Linux computers across the network. Backup execs, execs flexible calendar-based administration lets you easily schedule backups for processing during off-peak hours. So the takeaway from here is it lets you choose what you want to back up and when it specifically it will be backed up. So then they tell you here you get complete system recovery. Backup execs simplified disaster recovery takes all the guesswork out of recovering an entire system. So this is what we had talked about before. That's that's important. Comprehensive monitoring and intuitive mechanisms for everyday tasks. The job monitor provides a single location to monitor and manage all of your backup, restore, installation, and storage operation jobs. So basically, you have one place where you're going to look and you can see if everything is working properly. So are your backup jobs running? Hopefully they are, but if not, you're going to know here. So you can see that the job monitor is, is where you're going to pretty much look at everything that backup exec is doing and making sure that for on a day-to-day -day basis that it's all working properly. Because the last thing you want to do is find out that it hasn't backed up for a week and then you have a crash. So... That's just a little bit of overview into Backup Exec, and that is the end of this video. Thank you.